Some of the most well-known works in the Western literary tradition are epics. These include Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which are about the Trojan War, Virgil's Aeneid about the founding of Rome, the Anglo-Saxon epic Beowulf, Beowulf fights three monsters, Dante's The Divine Comedy, which describes a journey through hell, purgatory, and heaven, and John Milton's Paradise Lost, which recounts the revolt of the angels and the creation and fall of man. These are big stories. And to tell big stories, you need a kind of literature that can bear up under the tremendous weight of the themes, subjects, and the scopes of all these grand narratives. Well, of course, it's going to have to be in verse. Prose can't match verse for gravitas. The Greek epics are written in dactylic hexameter, and Dante's The Divine Comedy uses terza rima. Beowulf has that alliterative two-beat sejura two-beat thing going on. Too bad The Lord of the Rings isn't in verse, because then it too would be an epic. And if you're going to tell big stories, you're going to have to settle in for the long haul. Epics are long. Homer's Iliad has 12,000 lines, and the Odyssey has 15,000 lines of verse. So the basic definition of a literary epic is that it's a long narrative poem, but this is inadequate. Here are some more characteristics that we usually find in the long narratives that we call epics. Many literary epics begin with an invocation to a muse or deity. The poet seeks divine inspiration and guidance to tell this epic story. The subjects and themes of these stories are too important culturally and so spiritually significant that you can't simply rely solely on the skills of a mere mortal. So Homer in the Iliad invokes the goddess. Sing, goddess, the anger of Peleus' son Achilles, and its devastation, which put pains thousandfold upon the Achaeans, hurled in their multitudes to the house of Hades strong souls of heroes but gave their bodies to the delicate feasting of dogs of all birds, and the will of Zeus was accomplished. Since that time when first there stood in division of conflict Atreus' son, the lord of men and brilliant Achilles. In Paradise Lost, it is the heavenly muse, the Holy Spirit, who is invoked by Milton for supernatural aid to justify the ways of God to men. All literary epics are characterized by their formal diction and elevated style of language. This contributes to the epic's grandeur. This passage from Milton's Paradise Lost is one of my favorites. It describes Satan's defeat and expulsion from heaven. Him the Almighty hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire. Who durst defy the omnipotent to arms? I can't just sit in a chair and quietly read these epics. I think it's the language that makes it so you've got to read it out loud standing up. There are a lot of characters in an epic, but the action centers on the hero. One who embarks on remarkable adventures and performs extraordinary feats. These heroes often possess exceptional qualities and abilities. At least that's how they are presented by the storytellers. Hyperbolic descriptions of the main guys are definitely a thing. In the eponymous epic, Beowulf was among men the greatest in strength, most noble and mighty. With his warriors, he travels to assist Hrothgar and the Danes who are plagued by the fearsome monster Grendel. When he arrives, he offers a brief summary of his qualifications for killing Grendel. He says this, They had seen me boltered in the blood of enemies when I battled and bound the five beasts, raided a troll next, and in the night sea slaughtered sea brutes. I have suffered extreme and avenged the Geats. Their enemies brought it upon themselves. I devastated them. Now I mean to be a match for Grendel. Settle the outcome in single combat. Epic heroes are bigger, better, stronger, faster, and sometimes smarter than almost anyone who ever lived. They are larger than life awesome. Literary epics frequently incorporate supernatural or divine elements. Gods, goddesses, and mythical beings regularly intervene in the lives of mortals, either assisting or hindering the hero in his endeavors. These elements add to the scope of the story and produce awe and wonder in the listeners and the readers. So not too far into Homer's Iliad, Zeus gets mad at all the other gods for all their interfering in the war between the Achaeans and the Trojans. They've been picking sides, and he's got an agenda. This is from the Iliad. As long as morning rose and the blessed day grew stronger, the weapons hurtled side to side and men kept falling. But once the sun stood striding at high noon, then Father Zeus held out his sacred golden scales. In them he placed two fates of death that lays men low, one for the Trojan horsemen, one for the Argives armed in bronze. And gripping the beam mid-half, the father raised it high, and down went Achaia's day of doom. 
Kea's fate settled down on the earth that feeds us all, as the fate of Troy went lifting toward the sky. And Zeus let loose a huge crash of thunder from Ida, hurling his bolts in a flash against Achaea's armies. The men looked on in horror. White terror seized them all. But you know the gods. They had their tricks and they ended up getting more and more involved as the war continued. Literary epics unfold in expansive and diverse settings encompassing different lands and kingdoms or realms. The hero's journeys often take him to distant lands, introducing him to various cultures and presenting a wide range of landscapes and environments. The action spans not only geographical, but also cosmological space, across land, sea, and into the underworld, or through space or time. In the Odyssey, Odysseus and his men are on their way home to Ithaca from Troy. They raid successfully the Sicones, but because they linger, many men are lost in the counterattack. Then they end up in the land of the Lotus Eaters, where eating the lotus flowers induces blissful forgetfulness. Odysseus manages to get the journey going again. And there's that famous story with the Cyclops where they jam a tree in the guy's eye. Then he almost gets home, but they end up encountering these giant cannibals who destroy 11 of his ships. Then Circe turns a bunch of his crew into pigs. Then he visits Tiresias, a bunch of his friends from the Trojan War, and his mother in the underworld. Then he goes past the Sirens, you know that story. Then he has to go past two sea monsters and he has to choose which one to go closest to, and he loses more men. And then his crew's hungry so they slaughter the cattle of Helios, and that's a death sentence so they all die except Odysseus. And then he arrives alone on the island of Calypso. After a long time she releases him on a raft, and he has some adventures on his way to the Phaeacians, and they take him to Ithaca. All this takes him 10 years. Not every epic has a hero that travels that far, through that many realms, but most of them go somewhere. Epic poems often feature descriptions of grand battles or conflicts which are central to the story. These battles can involve massive armies, formidable monsters, and other significant adversaries, adding to the epic's excitement and drama. In Homer's Iliad, Diomedes has one very busy day. Now there was amid the Trojans one Darius, a rich man and blameless, a priest of Hephaestus, and he had two sons, Phegeus and Idaeus, both well skilled in all matter of fighting. These twain separated themselves from the host and went forth against Diomedes, they in their car, while he charged on foot upon the ground. And when they were come near, as they advanced against each other, first Phegeus let fly his far-shadowing spear, and over the left shoulder of the son of Tydeus, past the point of the spear, and smote him not. Then Tydeus' the son rushed on with the bronze, and not in vain did the shaft speed from his hand, but he smote his foe on the breast between the nipples, and thrust him from the car. And Idaeus sprang back, and left the beauteous chariot, and had no heart to bestride his slain brother. Nay, nor would he himself have escaped black fate, had not Hephaestus guarded him, and saved him, enfolding him in darkness, that his aged priest might not be utterly fordone with grief. Howbeit the horses did the son of great soul Tydeus drive forth, and give his comrades to bring to the hollow ships. But when the great souled Trojans beheld the two sons of Darius, the one in flight and the other slain beside the car, the hearts of all were dismayed. There's a lot more of this kind of thing in a lot of these epics. The epics generally relish battles and conflict. A distinct feature of epics, particularly those influenced by Homer's style, is the use of extended similes. So there's this physical description of Satan from Paradise Lost, just after he has been cast out of heaven. He's laying out in the lake of fire. Prone on the flood, extended long and large, lay floating many a rood, in bulk as huge as whom the fable's name of monstrous size, Titanian or Earthborn that warred on Jove, Triarios or Typhon, whom the den by ancient Tarsus held, or that great sea beast Leviathan, which God of all his works created hugest that swims the ocean stream. Him haply slumbering on the Norway foam, the pilot of some small night foundered skiff, deeming some island oft as seamen tell, with fixed anchor in his scaly rind moors by his side under the lee, while night invests the sea, and wished morn delays. So stretched out in huge the archfiend lay, chained upon the burning lake. Satan was big, like an island. These similes make me smile, but they also enrich the narrative and provide deeper insights into the characters and the events. Literary epics often serve as conduits for important moral, ethical, and cultural values within the society from which they originate. They reflect the beliefs, the norms, and the ideals of their culture, and it was likely intended that these stories help pass down these values to subsequent generations. Virgil's Aeneid emphasizes the importance of duty, 
fate, and the Roman identity. If you know anything about Aeneas, you know that as he fled the burning Troy, he dutifully carried his father on his back. If he was anything, he was a dutiful son. The Greeks still held the closely guarded gates, nor was there any further hope of aid. I yielded to my fate, and bearing still my sire toward the mountains took my way. This next quote comes from a time when Aeneas is having a bad day, but he's advised to simply carry on. The direction doesn't so much matter, as he will end up where fate decrees. Oh, there will be obstacles along the way, but Aeneas just needs to strive against these forces. He will ultimately establish Rome, because fate has determined it. Wherever fate may lead us, whether on or backward, let us follow. Whatsoever occurs, all fortune must be overcome by endurance. In Virgil's Aeneid, the Roman identity is communicated through a profound sense of ancestral pride, a belief in an imperial destiny, and the promotion of civic virtue and national unity. All these are intertwined with this vision that the Romans have of themselves as courageous and duty-bound citizens. If you don't believe me, just read it. It's dripping with Romanness. And here's the last characteristic. Epics have universal significance. They're not about local skirmishes or provincial conflicts. They involve entire peoples. After all, it involves the divine, good versus evil, and representatives from many different countries. It deals with the entirety of humanity. Homer's Odyssey explores the themes of perseverance, homecoming, and the human desires for adventure, offering insights to the universal quest for a sense of belonging and the enduring power of the human spirit. Beowulf focuses on themes of heroism, honor, and the inevitable passage of time, illustrating the universal allure of heroism and the fleeting nature of human existence. And from the Divine Comedy, we acquire an understanding of the themes of love, sin, redemption, and the human condition. And Milton's Paradise Loss addresses the themes of free will, temptation, and the nature of evil, providing timeless reflections on human moral choices and the consequences of rebellion. Big stuff. Big stories. It seems to me that the epic form is up to this task. A video is coming in which we will discuss the mock epic, Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock. That will be fun. Please subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.